Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Uttinger and Rachel Wojtek, and we're going to talk about Persian culture today. We left off with Persia conquering Babylon, Cyrus the Great. Um, we're just going to do a deep dive on, well, probably not too deep, probably more <laughs> broad than deep, yeah. but we'll, we'll, we'll dip down every now and then. Um, but I don't think we're talking about Persian cats or Persian no, carpets. I'm, no, no. I'm not what sure are we talking about? Well, uh, some historical uh, ethnographic background, I suppose. The Persians uh, are a latecomer in history. You know, as far, far back as the Tower of Babel, we have reference to the ancestor of the Medes, a man named Madai, I'm guessing pronouncing it right. He's one of Japheth's sons. And so the Medes, and therefore later the, the uh, Persians are Indo-Europeans, and uh, their land formed a portion of what is now Iran, or Irania, the land of the Aryans, which, which side issue, well, actually, it's the next thing on my notes now that I look. <laughs> <clears throat> the Medes and the Persians should be, should be counted contrary to Greek prejudice as peoples of the West, not the East, in the sense that if we're going to draw geographic lines along uh, ethnic boundaries, Japheth is usually counted as the father of Western peoples. He's the father of the Greeks. <laughs> but the Greeks tried to make this big deal of, no, they're Eastern, we're Western, they're despotic, and... And um, <laughs> they don't believe in self government and liberty. They, yeah, no, they don't. And and, and they, they roll around in luxury because they're richer than we are. And um, <laughs> which we <they're> resent. <laughs> they're conquering more people because we can't even get our act together yet. So they're obviously evil, and we are the champions of the free West. Yeah, the, the, looking back now with any kind of perspective makes that really laughable. Nonetheless, that is the flavor that taints most of the history books ever written in the West. They're all pro-Greek. They're anti-media, media, anti-Persia, except the Bible. The Bible does know that there are Greek peoples out there. It, it prophesies the coming of Alexander and the splintering of his kingdom. The first reference is to um, local pagan tribes capturing Hebrews and selling them to the Greeks. That's a great way to be introduced to the storyline. <laughs> <laughs> but once uh, media is f or Persia is, is firmly placed in the story, and we start seeing the, the Median Persian kings, most of them that we see do all right. Now, they, they, they're not coming out of a covenantal background. They don't remember the God of Scripture, as far as we can see. They are not polytheists in the traditional sense. And Rachel's going to talk about the, the dominant uh, Persian religion later on. But they tend to think of one great sky god who rules at least over all good things, maybe more. Uh, and, and so they weren't automatically hostile to the worship of Yahweh. Uh, the Bible speaks of Cyrus. Uh, god says of him by prophecy, he is my shepherd, uh, my servant. He shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shall be built into the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him, and so on. Uh, and Cyrus, in fact, is the one who issues a decree to rebuild the temple, to restore um, the Jewish people to their land, uh, initiating the second exodus. Uh, he's, and it apparently is the Darius of the Daniel and the Lion's Den story. So he is presented pretty uniformly as maybe not politically sharp or religious and ethnic matters comes come together. A great warrior, no doubt. Uh, but he means well, and he loves Daniel, and he wants to do what's right, and he wants to listen to the God of Daniel. So that, the next king who comes along who gets any uh, airtime in Scripture, there's a man named Darius. He was one of Cyrus's generals. And he's at uh, first he appears a danger because he's busy pulling the thing together after Cyrus and his uh, his son are gone. So he's kind of busy and he gets this appeal of, hey, they're building a city over here. It's going to cause you a lot of trouble. And he says, all right, well, tell them to stop that for now and I'll get back to you. But once they get back to him, he's like, um, this is for a temple for the God of heaven. Yeah, let's do that. We'll finance it. You take money out of your pocket and you pay them. <laughs> um, and then we run into, depending on how you interpret um, scripture at this point, he, more of Darius or his one of his successors 
uh, sends Ezra to teach the law of God in Jerusalem, sends Nehemiah as, a, as his cupbearer to rebuild the walls, marries Esther, and although, again, a little missing the cues here, almost enabling a mass genocide of the Jewish people at the last <laughs> Read fall. the fine print, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> yeah, I should have learned that one earlier. Um, yeah, so does come back and, and ends up ha ha married happily ever after. So the general percept perception of Scripture is that these people were not particularly evil. I mean, no more than the rest of us. They weren't out to destroy <laughs> yeah. God's people, except once. And that was kind of a misunderstanding, failure to read the fine print, all that. Uh, by and large, they were kinder and gentler than the Babylonian Assyrian kings who had gone before them. They Remember, the Assyrians had just used mass genocide and mass relocation to try to unify their empire, along with a little terror and violence thrown. And the Babylonians tried to um, co-opt the best and brightest and send them back as their agents, thus Daniel in Babylon U. The Medes and Persians more or less said, um, yeah, keep your own guys, keep your own laws, keep your own rules, keep your own gods, uh, but you need to supply us with taxes and soldiers because we have some conquering to do. And no, you don't have to look like us, dress like us, or anything. You don't care about that. A few other odds and ends, um, just more or less to, to, to put some icing on the cake or a little bit of... Um, flavor in the flower. The Persians are said to have valued truth above all, and a good deal of their lifestyle and religious orientation was in that direction. Uh, a real man does not lie. A real man tells the truth, even if it gets him in trouble. So that was really huge for them. They did not have the same kind of religious liturgies and hierarchies. They did not have temples. They did not have idols. So Herodotus says, they worship God in the open fields with, and I'll let Rachel talk about anything else that goes there. Um, so they weren't compelling temple prostitution or any of these wonderful things that the Babylonians and Assyrians had thought of. Uh, they uh, one, one small note that I find humorous, uh, if we are to believe Herodotus, and that's always a good question, when they wanted to make some really important decision, they all got drunk. <laughs> and then voted on the matter. When they recovered, In vino veritas. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> when when they recovered, they looked at their decision, and if it still seemed good when they were sober, then they went with it. There's so. something to that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so these, I mean, these David are... and I always have a glass of wine with our budget meetings. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what yeah. what what else is going on here? So well, we could talk. Briefly, um, there's an interesting connection between Persian culture and the U.S. mail service. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Uh, which is, uh, so there was a well-established and efficient uh, Persian courier mail system. That was mm -hmm. one of the early ones, and they built some of the early road systems that allowed people to move across the empire more efficiently. And so they were known for the fact that neither snow nor rain nor heat <laughs> nor darkness would keep them from accomplishing their task with all speed, even as the U.S. Mail Service would say mm. later. Huzzah! With a slight variation. Yeah, so. <laughs> no, that's, that was originally them. They didn't know uh, about snow or sleet or gloom. <laughs> oh, snow. Snow's the first one. Snow. No snow yeah. nor rain. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and something that goes with that, they were also great road builders. A lot of mm -hmm. the roads that Rome will get credit for later on were actually Persian roads yeah. that they developed. <laughs> like Rome perfected. was the first people to think of roads. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, we have a great empire. What shall we do? How shall we ever get around? We don't know. <laughs> yeah. So. Which is some uh, of those roads are ones that we'll see Ezra and Nehemiah and such using to, to go and others that mm. will go back to Israel. So things we will do after Rachel talks to us about our asterism, we at some point need to talk about how the Persians come in contact with Greece because it is kind of important and all the secular texts certainly spend a lot of time with it. But from a biblical point of view, far more pressing, at least immediately, is how the people of God redevelop their religious culture under the protection of Medo-Persia, this thing we call mm -hmm. the Restoration. 
So those are the two things that we need to come back to. We probably won't get to both of them today, but Rachel, why don't you talk to us now about Zoroastrianism? All right. So Zoroastrianism was considered uh, the primary religion of the Persian Empire, though obviously from the Bible, we see heavy influences from um, the true faith on people like Cyrus and others. Um, but Zoroastrianism begins obviously with a man named Zoroaster or Zarathustra, which that name we maybe would recognize more because of a book that Nietzsche wrote, uh, where he <laughs> picks a piece up of that music. character. <laughs> yeah, where he picks up that character and remakes him. So it's not the same thing. Um, but before Zoroaster, there was a general polytheistic religion among the Persians, but it had a top god, if you will, a king of the pantheon um, named Ahura Mazda. Mm -hmm. And Ahura Mazda will then continue into Zoroastrianism. But what happens is they move from this pantheon to Zoroaster when he's 30 um, and is likely himself a priest in the Magi of the gods. He receives a vision that says, actually, there's only one true God. Ahura Mazda is the only real God. All the others are fake gods. You need to stop worshiping them. Um, but that there is then a antagonist to the one true God, who is not a God. He's an evil spirit um, of some sort named Angra Mainu, Mainu something like that. Uh, I hear the Angra, so he's angry. And that's kind of hard. Right? <laughs> but so as the um, Persians valued truth and such things, Ahura Mazda is the symbol of all things true, honest, good, all of that. And his antagonist is lies, evil, destruction, all of those things um, that that are contrary to the good. So some of the things that he learned from his vision were that Ahura Mazda is the supreme god. He is the embodiment of everything good. Um, and that goodness is something we then are supposed to embrace through our good thoughts, good works, and good deeds. Those are kind of their trio of good. Um, but each person has to choose the good and reject the evil. But there's this constant struggle in the world between those two forces. Which, so we get the dualism there. Um, but because he claimed that Ohura Mazda was the only real god, uh, many historians call this one of the oldest monotheistic religions, which is kind of, I, I wouldn't necessarily call it that since there seems to be a lot of other forces and he is not supreme or um, any, any such thing that we would call um, a true God. But, um, and definitely it is not the oldest monotheistic religion because obviously <laughs> the true religion has been there from the beginning. Uh, but... <laughs> So, so you have it. But it is interesting that we have kind of fewer examples of pagan monotheism. This is true. So there are, yeah, there are little um, places where it pops up of, oh, actually, there should only be one true God. Oh, God should actually be good. And, um, <laughs> yeah. and Revolutionary he should tell thought. the truth. <laughs> and he's light and not darkness. He doesn't have, you know, this side where he's conniving and manipulative in the background. Uh, one other interesting thing is um, Zoroaster said that he actually was the creator of everything as well. So there's, it's interesting because you see these little sprinkles of what we would think of as um, biblical Christianity and truth, but then shifting and mixing. Um, so what's the timeline on this? Could, could Zoroaster have been influenced by knowledge of the Hebrew religion? Well, they don't know exactly when he was born, but they estimate it somewhere between uh, 1500 BC and 1000 BC. Oh, so that's quite a it, range. <laughs> yeah. So it it was about f at least 500 years before the Persian um, Empire, as we know it, okay. uh, came into being. Um, and he was also mostly rejected in his lifetime. He had to mm -hmm. flee and go somewhere else and find other people that would listen to him. Um, so it wasn't like a great 
wonderful revival religion um, <laughs> where he's running around going, gay guys, there's only one God. And they're going, go away. We hate you. We're going to beat you up and all of that. <laughs> Sounds more uh, like Islam, as you were mentioning before we started recording. <laughs> yeah. So some of the really interesting parallels I see in Islam to Zoroastrianism is you have it beginning with a single vision to a single man who has been in a polytheistic setting and learns, oh, there's actually only one God and you have to choose to follow him and do the good and reject the evil. And it's based upon your um, continuous will of choosing to follow him, um, which is also something in Islam that they speak of. You must choose to stay on the right path choose the right path, be on the right path. Um, but also the fact that there were no written scriptures or anything at the time, any of the followers who did believe uh, the revelation memorized and recited everything. That happened hmm. for Zoroaster. It happened for Muhammad, where they go for quite a while before they actually write anything down. And so you have this huge separation between the supposed revelation and the actual recording of it, uh, which makes, of course... Lots of questions for the authenticity of what was actually recorded. Um, but yeah, in this, the overall message of there's a general good versus evil, pick the good God who will, will, you know, give you good things, give you a good afterlife because he's one of the early ones among more pagan religions to also speak of the end of the world coming with judgment and there being this mm -hmm. afterlife that, that you're trying to build towards in this life. One other fun fact about Zoroastrianism is he kept something from the previous versions of the religion in his area, which was they had uh, fire temples. Mm. <laughs> and so that had the continuous fire. And so they actually still um, keep that if they're able to practice their religion, because that's their core element is they believe mm. fire was created last and is the best of all the elements. Um, but they, like Islam, also had the revelation that blood sacrifice is no good, that the true God does not want blood. He wants your good choices and good actions. And so don't sacrifice anything to him and that that's, that's actually an abomination to him. Hmm. <laughs> Sounds so friendly and kind. <laughs> yes. It's, it's very, it reminds me of a lot of, um, enlightenment religion and things like that of be good, do good. Um, you can by your own will or knowledge make the right choices and walk on the right path and all will and be well. And it totally precludes the expiation of guilt. <laughs> yes, we don't need any blood. There, there's always that. Um, instead, you just need to fight in the fight of this good versus evil. And you can win if you will just try hard enough. We don't, we don't generally have Zoroastrian neighbors. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know of any, No, but the, the framework that eventually is picked up by Manichaeanism later on in the mm -hmm. early Roman empire, is still with us. Good God, bad mm -hmm. God, mm -hmm. good God rules over light and spirit and niceness and puppy dogs and rainbows. Bad God rules over matter and material things and sex and money and all that, which has found its way into the church. Mm -hmm. Um, the God of the Bible is the good God who only rules over nice, spiritual, clean things, not nasty things. And the devil is the bad God. And there's this eternal war going on between the two, which is not biblical Christianity, but sometimes we. Well, and we how many people, people would simply that. give that message to their children of you just need to say good things and have good deeds and good yes. thoughts. Mm -hmm. And that's how we become a good person and yeah. please God. Contrast no. with the traditional prayer of confession that says, I have sinned in thought, <laughs> word, and deed. Mm -hmm. Yes. Once again, much to be said for traditional liturgies, because they remind us of the obvious that we mm -hmm. find not so obvious left to our own devices. <laughs> it's so easy to ignore the obvious. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Lewis has a great line in some place, I think, in, oh, it's in screw tape letters, the neglect and horror of the obvious. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah we're, we're good at that. Well, let's take a moment and look at what's happening in Israel. So Cyrus releases God's people, makes a decree, but it is one of these, you can do this if you want to. You all can go back home. Now, we don't think of needing travel visas within our own country, but in that part of the world then, and in that part of the world for a very long time and probably still today, you needed government permission 
for any kind of significant movement and certainly for mass migrations. So Cyrus, in doing this, this is a big deal, allowing a whole mass migration of, he does not know how many people this will be, from wherever they are to this, this little land in the corner of Palestine. But he has read the prophecies of Isaiah. Uh, God through Isaiah had named Cyrus by name, called him his anointed, his shepherd, his Messiah. Um, and so Cyrus is about to do this, and he arranges to fund the rebuilding of the temple and the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Both are in view, but God's people begin well, and is so often the case, especially when reigniting the covenant, that they don't continue well. The uh, book of Ezra gives us, uh, first of all, it gives us Cyrus to Korea. I probably should read it if my eyes will focus. The first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. That prophecy was that the captivity would last 70 years. So the 70 years are up. Daniel's been tracking that. You read through Daniel's prophecy. He makes note of, I knew by the by books so that time was near, and things weren't going on yet. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth. And he does use uh, Yahweh Elohim. Um, and he hath charged me to build him, he hath charged me to build him a house mm -hmm. at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of the place help him with silver and with gold and with goods and with beasts and with free will offerings for the house of the God that's in Jerusalem. And Cyrus brings out the temple vessels and commits them to the leaders of the Jewish people, sends them back with additional offerings from himself and his court. Uh, the two men who lead the return uh, and we, we read about them in the first half of Ezra and also in, in the prophecies of Haggai and Zechariah. Their name is Zerubbabel and Joshua, or Jeshua, or Yeshua, depending, or Jesus, if you want to go more modern. Um, Zerubbabel is a prince of Judah. He stands in the line of both Mary and Joseph, and that's a little mm -hmm. odd. Uh, he's not a, he's a prince of Judah for Judah, but not within the Persian Empire. He's the governor in the Persian Empire. So he answers directly to Cyrus. Uh, the reason he's not a prince or a king or someone in the kingly line is back before Jerusalem fell, one of the last kings, a young man named Jeconiah, had been so wicked that God through Jeremiah had said, write this man childless, none of his seed will ever sit on the throne of Israel ruling anymore you know, over Judah. And so God himself had ended the uh, royal prerogatives of the Davidic line. So Zerubbabel's in that line, and so will Joseph, uh, Jesus' uh, adoptive father, be. But by God's own decree, that line, it, it, it exists technically after a legal fashion, but it can convey nothing except memories. <laughs> because no one in that line can be king. The, the only one that could be king would be a true son of David who was not descended from that line. <laughs> ha! Huh. Anyway, that's for later. <laughs> but this Zerubbabel, like Cyrus, becomes uh, a type of Christ in that he is a prince of Judah. He is the governor's right-hand man here. He's rebuilding the temple. He's leading the second exodus. So in a lot of and in, in the prophecies of, um, of Haggai and Zechariah, he is very much highlighted uh, as God's man for the hour. But working with him is this other fellow, a um, high priest, who's called uh, Jeshua, or Yeshua, or Joshua, or Jesus. They're all the same name with variations. Jehovah's is salvation. And, and so, again, he has our Lord's name. He helps lead the return from exile. He's the high priest. He re rebuilds the temple, reinstitutes sacrifice. So we have this king-priest combination uh, reigniting um, God's worship. Now, I have spoken of this as a restoration covenant, and once or twice people have said, well, where do you get that? That's not on the standard list of covenants. Well, if you turn, we won't go there right now, but if you turn to toward the end of Nehemiah, you will see that once everything is in place, 
the people of God say, let's make a covenant. <laughs> it's called a covenant. And they, they sign it and they seal to it and, and they make a big deal over it. But this is after not only worship has been, has been restored and the temple up and running, but the walls have been built and the whole city is dedicated to the Lord and it becomes mm -hmm. the holy city. But more broadly, why speak of this as, as a renewed covenant? Because so many things change. Mm -hmm. uh, the easy way to see this is just to look and see what Israel does not have anymore. Uh, there's no Davidic king. So in that respect, it looks like the Davidic covenant has failed. It hasn't, but you'd be tempted to think so. Uh, it's certainly no disconnected from their forms of worship and interaction politically yeah. and spiritually. Yeah. But and they're going to have very few remaining prophets as well in terms of those that would write scripture or like the prophets we see with David of Nathan and Gad. You don't really see that appearance anymore. No, we've got three prophets, three people we call prophets left. Ezra himself and Nehemiah are prophets after a fashion. Um, and but whoever it seems wrote only the Esther. beginning. Yeah, it's, it's right. It's right at the beginning, at the, at the time of transition and transformation, and there will not be another until John the Baptist comes. Mm -hmm. At least, no one to speak of. Uh, they so they don't have that. They don't have the Ark of the Covenant, which is kind of a big deal when it's time for the Day of Atonement. Mm -hmm. What exactly did they do with the blood on the Day of Atonement? They go behind the veil and what? Sprinkle where the Ark of the Covenant used to be. <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> I don't. I, I've never seen Jewish sources address that. I don't know mm -hmm. what they did. And Christian sources generally are so um, not interested in such things that no one, I've never actually seen anyone address or, or even ask the question, what happened? Mm -hmm. I wonder uh, if some of it is due to the fact that now the Jewish religion attempts to go on without the Ark of the Covenant. And no. so they have completely remade the way that they practice the Day of Atonement. So I wonder if there's a certain um, not discussing that because it's more like, well, this was how it the Lord actually started us without that. And so we're no. not supposed to have it. So mm -hmm. that, there could be, be a certain yeah, the argument then back. for a, a discontinuity in a certain sense between the covenants. Like the Ark of the Covenant is in a sense, we can tell from the name, an embodiment of the covenant that God mm -hmm. had made. And mm -hmm. that's not there anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And with inside are the tables of stone, which are called the covenant more than once. Mm -hmm. And they're gone. We don't know where they are. And probably not in a city called Tanis, somewhere in the deep uh, deserts of Egypt. Uh, <laughs> we don't know what happened. The last reference, I believe, is during the days of Josiah when he basically says, okay, Levites, you're not messing with us anymore. Leave it alone and go do other things. And that's it. We, it, When the city falls and we have detailed descriptions of a lot of what happened as the city and the temple were broken down with, we know what happened to the, the big brass pillars outside. There's absolutely no mention of the Ark of the Covenant. So there's been all kinds of speculations to what happened, how it, how it went away, who took it, where it was mm -hmm. hidden. Was it just the destroyed? Catholics probably think it was assumed into heaven, like oh, there Mary, you go. because the Mary is the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> you shouldn't let the pagans touch it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, my my general guess is the Lord knew we shouldn't have it, and that yeah. it probably was taken and melted down as if it was nothing. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. The only other reference is in the Book of Revelation, where oddly enough, in vision, in symbol, it is seen in heaven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's not, does it mean there's literally a box there? It means that the covenant henceforth is, has its focus and center in heaven in the reign of Christ, not in gold boxes. Well, and if we believe that the heavenly sanctuary is the true sanctuary of which ours was just a, a mm -hmm. reflection, then there would be some sort of um, true Ark of the Covenant there in mm -hmm. heaven the whole time. So we don't need it to ascend up. It yes. It would already yes. be there. It's <laughs> just a realization that, well, Christ is the focus. And he is the covenant. He's called yeah. such in the prophets. Yeah. Not just the meteor of the covenant. He is the covenant. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they don't have that. There's the, the divinely lit flame on the altar, long gone. There's no Shaginic glory filling the temple. That does not mean God's glory was not there. It just wasn't there in lights and, and effects. Interesting contrast with Zoroastrianism there, where there's mm. not a continuity of fire. Yeah. Um, and I may have missed some things, but th those are at least some uh, some major things that are reorienting this covenant administration. On the other hand, there are some positives. Uh, I mean, these are positives. They just don't look like it. Once, you, once the <laughs> physical and the outward becomes a crutch and you lose it, you stop trying to walk and you complain you don't have a crutch anymore. But God was doing other things. He finished the Old Testament, 
which has a very complete picture of the coming Messiah, so much that Paul could preach from the Old Testament and say, I'm not saying anything that the prophets didn't say. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a pretty broad claim. It's like, yeah. well, you know, the prophets in principle said these things, but it was kind of, no, Paul says, I'm just saying what they said. There's nothing new here. So that they had, that was that was big. Um, and all the times Jesus said to the Pharisees, don't you know the scriptures? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he means yeah. the Old Testament. Yes, yes that would <laughs> be that. Call it. Uh, God's people did not all return to Israel. In fact, most of them didn't. So they remain spread throughout the empire, and with the coming of Alexander and then of Rome, they keep traveling further and further, so that by the time of the Council of Jerusalem, James can say Moses has in every city the people who read and know about him. And everywhere the apostles go, there are synagogues where they can stop and use his launching pads as basis for beginning to evangelize. So this is huge, but even in the moment, here we have God's people spread throughout the world, living in the world, living among Gentiles, witnessing to their Gentile neighbors, meeting on the Sabbath day to hear God's word and to chant praises and um, to hear sermons and to pray, and then go out again and evangelize their neighbors. This sounds kind of familiar. Mm -hmm. God is getting his people ready for what's about to come. It's also, uh, it corresponds to the scattering of the seed. You know, the the people have been scattered and in a sense have died. There's yes. there's not a cohesive identity, but they've been scattered so that when the water of the gospel comes, mm, mm-hmm. very nice. There will be growth. Yeah. Well, and it, this is where in history now our vision should start to spread out as well because we're trying to track the spread of God's people, but his people are more everywhere. Yeah. Uh, but we should also expect to see more and can uh, see more influences of the scriptures on other cultures, even before the coming of Christ. So that when we see them saying things or doing things that align with the scriptures, it's not far fetched to say they probably yeah. actually heard it from their Jewish neighbor <laughs> or went to synagogue or something like that. Yeah. It's not surprising. <laughs> that they should have <laughs> their yeah. starting to aspects of the truth. Yeah, mm-hmm. We're going to be, when we finish Persia, we'll be moving toward Greece. And one question that will come up is, did these philosophers read Moses? The church father <laughs> said, duh. <laughs> <laughs> the, the world looks at that and says, well, why would they? Because Jewish people were scattered all over the place and because they actually had a book that was a yeah. word from God <laughs> and they would tell people whether they told them in humility and in true faith or in self-righteousness and cultural pride, they would tell them. Uh, and so these philosophers, even if they were listening to their servants, you can think of all the times in scripture where servants and slaves, uh, captives, got the right ear of somebody important and that someone important turned to the God of Israel, either in truth or at least outwardly. Mm-hmm. So now, you know, one of the, the topics that, that forms the backdrop for, for a study of history, especially at this point, is the idea of common grace. I'm not sure mm-hmm. I like the words, but let's go with them. The idea is that God s- spreads his gracious presence and power beyond the bounds of his covenant people for the sake of his covenant people. And that's really mm-hmm. important because too Very often it's, it's like there's a separate, God has his saving grace, but then he has this other grace over here. They're kind of different things. No, that's not what's going on here. All grace is in Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I made a reference a while back that, that David asked me about. Uh, I spoke of Jesus as the savior of all men, especially those who believe. Mm-hmm. And David missed that. That's actually a quote from, from St. Paul from mm-hmm. one of the well, epistles to Timothy. Mm-hmm. He, the only savior there is, is God. The only savior for the whole world is God. If anybody's saved from anybody, anytime, in any way, it's God who did it. Yeah. And, and John's Paul, epistles say something very similar, don't they? Yeah. And, yeah. and um, or Paul on Mars Hill, when he says, let me tell you about this unknown God. He's not being cute. Mm-hmm. He's saying, this is the true God who has intervened in your, in your history and times past. You time for you to get to know him. Uh, and so... A key element in maintaining any degree of rationality and morality in the ancient world was this constant injection or overflow of knowledge from the covenant people. You can think of Solomon's servants sailing the seven seas with the Phoenicians 
and going everywhere. But here, this is huge. God's people are being spread abroad and continue to spread abroad and take scripture and worship with them so that, yes, we know they reach the Greeks. And in fact, one of the questions in Greek philosophy we're going to see is, why do these people go from these uh, these Olympian deities who were more or less nature gods originally and been humanized by, Herod- by um, Homer and Hesiod, why do they suddenly start talking about God as being one and light and truth and, huh, who were their neighbors just about then? Oh, the Persians. <laughs> Who were the who were who had the Persians ears? Oh, you mean people like Ezra and Nehemiah and Daniel and um, Esther, Esther, <laughs> Zerubbabel? Yeah. Huh. I wonder if there's a connection there. And of course, seculars would just snort at that and say, "No, that's ridiculous. That's a, you're trying to mix your Bible with history." No, <laughs> our Bible is history. <laughs> Bible is the heart of history, and we should mm-hmm. be surprised if these kind of things aren't happening. But because of the dichotomy that we've inherited of Bible one thing, history another, it just feels weird to make the jump across and to connect things unless the Bible actually says it. But as I've said many times, God, for some reason, assumes we're not stupid. (laughs) I'm not sure why that is, because we are, both in our own ignorance and our sins. There's so many times when we should be able to say, well... Here were the people who were, in effect, running the empire, or at least really close to the emperor. Don't you think their ideas would be felt throughout? We, we know that when the empire found out that Mordecai was a Jew, a couple things happened. One, they were afraid of Mordecai. Two, <laughs> a lot of people became Jews. What? Mm-hmm. The text says this. We just blow over it. A lot of people can't were... imagine, you know, studying the founding of the United States and the drafting of our founding documents and all mm-hmm. the discourse and discussion that was going on without encountering the enlightenment, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like ideas do ripple through actions. Yeah. And people then act on those ideas. All they, although they don't actually always admit where they got their ideas. If you went mm-hmm. back and read the Enlightenment philosophers, you might not know that there ever was such a thing as Christianity or what you would get by reading <laughs> them would be a very watered down, secularized. Oh, there was this great teacher named Jesus who said some good yeah. things about love. And yet and, you can't uh, have the Enlightenment without Christianity. No, you can't. It doesn't, mm-hmm. it doesn't work. Uh, but it would be easy enough to, to pretend it didn't if you mm-hmm. did not know what Christianity is, if you didn't know the rest of the story, <laughs> as Paul Harvey would say. Mm-hmm. Well, that may be a good place to, to kind of wind down, because the next step is going to be how Greece encounter, or how the Persians encounter Greece, and how that begins to shift the balance of power, and it will pave our way for talking about Greek culture and philosophy and such. Very cool. All right, should we close out with some recommendations? Well, since you mentioned Paul Harvey, I'll just jump <laughs> in. Um, I, I grew up with the the rest of the story mm. on the radio, and the I think there were some published collections of the yes, stories that we had. Um, have you heard of Mike Rowe? I know the name. Yeah, he uh, he did Dirty Jobs, the mm-hmm. the show, mm-hmm. um, and he okay. yes, loved yes. Paul Harvey, and sort of picked up his own version of the rest of the story and it's called the way I heard it. Mm. Um, so he's like, this is not all documented the way like a history should be. This is just the story, the way I heard it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so there's that little podcast that he produces very similar to Paul Harvey short, um, you know, kind of mysterious. You don't know who he's talking about until the end. Um, mm. But he also published a book, um, the way I heard it that is a mixture of his memoirs with these stories and sort of how he got to be where he is as the the jack of all trades of America, you know? Mm-hmm. Really interesting story. Interesting guy. Really fun read. Okay. Rachel, do you have anything? So I'm going to recommend a book that my mom gave me uh, that is called Fearfully and Wonderfully Made, and it's put out um, by the Creation Museum and and I think it's Answers in Genesis. Uh, They actually created an exhibit there at the Creation Museum 
that has a 3D replica of every week of what a baby looks like in the womb. Mm. And they've created a book that you can buy. So it's it's more like a picture book. So you could use it with children, um, but it, they're very lifelike and they just have real simple descriptions. But it's it's been fun for me being pregnant, but also my mom used it with some of her grandkids to mm. say, oh, this is what Aunt Rachel's baby looks like right now. Oh. So it's, it's a fun way for kids and adults to get a little look into what's going on and... Um, yeah, it's because, you know, we get little bits here and there, but we rarely get that sense of like every single week, this is what what a baby would look like. So I recommend that. All right. Well, far less interesting and even human. <laughs> uh, I'm going to recommend Herodotus, the histories, because we keep right. coming up with this. Mm -hmm. uh, he is and we called, give him a hard time. And we give him a hard time, and rightly so. <laughs> He's called the father of history by uh, humanists who don't consider Scripture to be history. And yet, once you start reading him, the stories are... He, he's giving us the background for the, the Greek and Persian Wars. And so he goes back and gives us the history of Persia and the Greek colonies and so on. And there's a lot of interesting things. And the the stories intertwine and go generational, and it's there's a lot of fun stuff there. How many of them are actually historically accurate is something else altogether. <laughs> and most modern historians seem to just discount them with a wave of the hand after insisting he's the father of history. What they're really getting at is that he has dismissed the Olympian gods and is telling these stories as as brute fact, as this is just what happened. This is what people are. Mm, Man is action. the new God. Yeah, it's all about human action. Uh, but he, he writes well, and, and he says interesting mm -hmm. things, and some of it may even be true. Uh, yeah, it's, were, it is funny how, like, the people used to say the city of Troy didn't exist. Yeah. It's like, oh, Homer just made that up, you know. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not Herodotus, the case. <laughs> Herodotus assumes it's completely true. Mm -hmm. But then Herodotus is written off because he, so many other places he's gone after uh, urban legends and her historical legends or whatever. As far as we know, because you know what? Aside from scripture, nobody else was writing history at this point because it was mm -hmm. not a thing in pagan culture. So this is a good point to move, I, I don't want to say beyond scripture, but to bring under the light of scripture Mm -hmm. the little bit of secular history we do have at the time and see what they were saying and how it was being written and to what intent. And it's and not... And enjoy it. And enjoy it. He's he's mm -hmm. a newsy, funny kind of writer. And you, if you like history at all, you'll probably enjoy him. There you go. Great. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been a delight. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thank you to you, our listener. We appreciate you tuning in. Uh, if you'd like to share this podcast with a friend, uh, please do so. Word of mouth is great. Uh, you can also use the share links in whatever podcast catcher you use. We're on YouTube. We're on Spotify. We're on Apple. We're on all the major players. Uh, if you'd like to send us an email, you can reach us at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. That's the best way to get in touch with us. And a huge thank you also to our financial supporters for keeping the show rolling. Uh, if you'd like to join their number, you can visit patreon.com slash halting towards Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.